we could do a couple different things right now uh, to start. We can go down the, the rabbit hole of looking at the worldometer and looking at uh, current active cases, death rates, and things like that. Uh, we can jump in to the molecular biology of actually what it does if you're infected by it. So you have a better understanding of how your body's responding. And if you are becoming symptomatic, um, you can have an idea what's going on inside of you and how that virus gets into your cell. Um, and then I, I wanna talk about tonight, this new vaccine um, that might be being developed that's messenger RNA based, which is really, really cool in vaccine development. And I, I'm, skeptical but if it works it'd be groundbreaking so what breakthroughs have there been with finding a cure none yet um but we are going to be talking about a possible new vaccine methodology or method tonight using messenger rna uh, but right now it's symptomatic treatment so inflammation in the lungs anti-inflammatories um shortness of breath uh, a respirator uh, things like that so, uh, Patine said, I hear people can test negative to Corona like six times before they actually return a positive. Uh, can you explain how these tests are done? So this is done via something called RT-PCR. R-T-P-C-R. Uh, that stands for Reverse Transcriptase Polymerase Chain Reaction. So RT-PCR, what that does, so what, if you would go get tested, um, that takes out it just takes like a, a serum sample, you, a spit swab. Uh, and in that you have all your DNA and you have all the viral DNA. Uh, so not DNA, but RNA. So a virus, the, this is the little coronavirus here, has these little spike proteins on it. And inside is messenger RNA. Uh, so what they do with this is they take that sequence and they, they know the sequence of it. Uh, so this is the SARS-CoV-2. So this messenger RNA right here um, has a little sequence on it. Uh, this little sequence can be isolated and maximized using PCR. Um, so what this does, so this is RT-PCR, meaning uh, reverse transcriptase PCR. So it takes this messenger RNA right here and then amplifies a certain region. So we won't go through the process, but it goes through this heating and denaturing cycle. And then we get a bunch of just this sequence right here that's specific to the SARS coronavirus. Um, then they they don't have to run this on a gel anymore. They can just add a fluorescent tag, like I'm drawing it in green here. And then on their little instrument, if it gets a green blip on it, they're like, oh, positive. If it doesn't get that green blip, and if it's just, you know, non-green, let's say it's that color, that'd be negative. Um, but this PCR goes through this amplification process to maximize the production of it. Yeah, so reverse transcriptase takes the RNA and turns it into DNA. And then once we have that sequence in the DNA, we can amplify it using, so this would be the DNA then, which is a double strand. We then take that sequence of that, and then we amplify little DNA sequences. And then that's what we then analyze on that gel right there, or however it does it. So a bad test would target a bad section? No, not, so um, a failure to do this test correctly wouldn't necessarily be a bad section. It just didn't work. Some That's why you have to do a test multiple times. Um, how long does this test take? I'm not sure how long this one takes. When I did PCR in the laboratory, it took a couple hours to do it. So if you don't have that virus, so here, swab is done. Could have RNA, could have the virus, or it has no virus, or the person had the virus, but none, maybe, so here, there were a bunch. A bunch of viruses isolated because the infection was already pretty severe in that person. The virus was replicating a lot and easily released, but this person only had one. And all these samples now underwent RT-PCR. So all these lines going down and now RT-PCR. Um, so this person had it. What happens in this person? There's a, all these gene sequences in here become amplified. 
That's what PCR does. Amplifies it so a reading can be made from it. So this one would be a positive test. This one, since there's no sequence, nothing will be read. There'd be nothing here. This would be a negative test. This one, there might have just been... It might have never actually gotten to that RNA. or So it might have happened too late and there not, might not have been enough read. So this one could come back negative. So even though this person has the virus, not enough information was read in order to do so. Eventually, what's going to happen is we're going to have a whole bunch of sequences that are this long right here and then that's then what they can amplify and analyze on the gel so if you don't have enough to start with here you might not be able to amplify enough and it's going to give you a false negative or f yeah it's going to give you a negative result uh, so this could be someone that's just starting to get the virus they might not get enough out whereas this person out here has the full-on virus or it could have just been a bad swab maybe the swab was inefficient uh, maybe they weren't actively uh, coughing up the virus at the time. So a lot of different things could go wrong here that lead to this. This this process here, it gets screwed up and it doesn't work. And then if you never successfully turn this DNA, uh, this RNA back into DNA and go through this process, you get, you get a false negative. Um, and then you do it again, it might work. So it's, it's like has a, I think 80% um, pull through rate and that's the thing about science science is all about like an n equal you know 40 for a random number you take that n equal 40 um you know 36 of them work and then that you get the little p value for statistics so you want your p value to be less than 0.05 which means your data has less than um five percent error in it and that means your data is significant enough in the realms of science uh okay so right now uh, 83,000. uh Total cases, that's not active, that's just total that there's been. Uh, right now, there are 43,000 active cases. 19% uh, of them are in serious or critical condition. 81% uh, of them are in mild condition. Oh, I do, I got an ad. Um, here, there are 40,000 closed cases. 93% have recovered. And this was 8% earlier today, 7% uh, deaths. Uh, so this is, this, and you can't say the death rate off this. You don't really figure out the real death rate until after um, it has spread and has gotten around enough where you have enough end values. And not only that, uh, numbers are usually uh, underreported. So these are the ones we know have recovered or have died specifically from this virus. Um, how many never actually got, you know, declared having COVID-19? Um, so this would technically be a little lower than. So then, uh, what I like about this page is it gives a lot of analysis and, um, uh, I like this little graph right here. It shows new cases, uh, each day. Um, death numbers are usually accurate. Yeah. But yeah, so this is what I'm watching now. This is the first time another country has had more, uh, new cases than China. So that's the saying that this is now spreading substantially outside of China. Uh, so Italy is so bad because there's a northern section in Italy where they had an outbreak and now it's spreading. And that's Diamond Princess uh, is a cruise ship that's currently docked off of Japan and is filled with people infected by the virus. So how do you know if you have the virus? Uh, the symptoms are shortness of breath, fever, uh, dry cough, and uh, malaise or lethargy. Uh, so you feel really, really exhausted. So it feels like you have the, the, the flu. Typical symptoms, but they're long lasting and the respiratory issues could get eventually worse, worse if, if the inflammation becomes a problem. So here, the big thing is, so right here at 2% question mark for the fatality rate. Um, this incubation period is a big part. How long can you carry this virus, be spreading it, but be asymptomatic, meaning you don't have any symptoms. Uh, and that's the big thing they're trying to figure out uh, because if you can walk around in public for a week without having any symptoms, but you're spreading the virus as you're walking around, it's not a great thing. Um, and this R not here, um, you know, let's zoom in on this since half the screen isn't available anyway. Um, this R not is how many people one person can affect roughly. They're still not sure exactly how it transmitted. So um, it's called zoonotic transfer when it's in an organism then transfers to a human. 
and there was some debate of what organism it so they since it's so heavily SARS related it's over 80 percent SARS genetically um and that's from bats and they say this Chinese market had a bunch of animals that aren't normally in close proximity in close proximity so this virus jumped to another animal and there was argument that was the pangolins uh snakes I saw one about the fish um and then it uh, underwent natural selection in those other animals, added some different sequences to it, and then it was able to infect humans. Um, but there's a lot of studies that are going against that now, and maybe it was more of a natural selection event that occurred in bats, between bats and humans directly. All right, so we're, we're talking about this paper because we were talking about the origin of the virus and weaponizing it and how there are conspiracy theories out there going around that this virus was uh, bioengineered to undermine the Trump administration and to crash the economy right before the re-election by the Chinese. Yes, people are actually saying this. Um, I know it's as crazy as it sounds. So there are a few things I want to talk about in this paper. So what this paper was looking at was trying to figure out where this virus came from. Um, yeah, this is this paper does get heavy on some certain topics, uh, but I just want to highlight a few parts here. We offer perspective on a notable features and discuss the features uh, where these features could have arisen. Provides evidence is not laboratory construct nor purposefully manipulated virus. So this is a big thing here. If this was made in a laboratory, it was not done well. <laughs> this is one of the bigger statements here. Um, based on modeling and biochemical experiments, SARS-CoV-2 seems to have, don't worry about RDB, that may bind with high affinity to ACE2 from human, non-human primate, ferret, pig, and cat, as well as other species with high receptor homology. Okay, what does this mean in English? Uh, the SARS-CoV-2 has a receptor on it. Uh, membrane protein. It's called the spike protein that sticks out the surface. It binds to a membrane on your lung cells, well, a cell on your lung cell that has a receptor on it called ACE2. ACE2 stands for angiotensin converting enzyme 2. So SARS-CoV-2 binds to that and that's how it gets into your cell. This cell that has this ACE2 receptor is the cell that makes something called surfactant in your lungs. Um, so it binds. That's what this binds to. So in contrast, though, it may bind less efficiently to ACE2 and other species associated with these viruses, including rodents and civets. Um, so here, it's the spike protein appears to be a result of natural selection on human or human-like ACE2, permitting another optimal binding solution to arise. This is strong evidence that this is not the product of gen genetic engineering, meaning that it can bind to this receptor. We know better binding patterns to this receptor, uh, but that one wasn't chosen. A genetically engineered one would be really good. Natural selection one would be sloppy because it's natural selection, it just happened randomly. Whereas one engineered in the lab, if you wanted to bind to the ACE2 receptor, you know the sequences that would optimally bind to that receptor to have the strongest effect possible. Why, if you're bioengineering something, would you make something that's not super effective? 